Good afternoon. I'm Andy Schoenholtz. I'm a professor here at Georgetown Law, and I want to thank again my wonderful colleagues from MPI and Clinic for organizing these extraordinary sessions. We're all learning a lot, and we will continue to learn now about refugee resettlement issues. You heard actually our keynoters, both our keynoters talk about refugee resettlement already. They already teed this up in some ways. Um, if you aren't familiar with the refugee resettlement program, it's the program where the United States selects refugees from abroad and brings them to the United States. And it was actually created in the aftermath of the fall of Saigon to rescue Indo-Chinese who were at risk at that time. And then it was formalized in the Refugee Act of 1980. Since then, over three million refugees have been resettled in the United States. And as one of our keynoters pointed out, the US is considered a leader in refugee resettlement, and not in terms of absolute per capita numbers, but in terms of absolute numbers. We are considered a leader. Uh, this is also the program that was almost shut down by the White House after 9-11. And here we are today, 15 years later, with new challenges that have arisen just at the moment when the need to protect refugees is greater than ever. So we have a great panel to discuss these issues. Uh, to my immediate right is Anna Green, who's the Policy and Advocacy Director for U.S. Programs at the International Rescue Committee. She will be talking about what is going on at the state level for resettlement agencies and all the players, all the stakeholders at the local level, because that's where a lot of the concerns are being raised. Uh, to Anna's right is my friend and colleague, Alex Elenikoff, my former dean who hired me here. <laughs> Thank you, Alex. <laughs> who is also the former UN Deputy High Commissioner for Refugees and now a visiting professor of law at Columbia Law School. Alex is going to be th talking about the, this from a global perspective and also somebody who's been familiar with the Refugee Resettlement Program for a long time. So he'll take us back into the larger context and also talk about the implications of what's going on right now, these new challenges. And to his right is Professor Kevin Fandel, who's uh, at the Temple University Fox School of Business. Kevin has written a really thoughtful legal analysis of the challenge, the actual legal challenges that states have made to the federal government uh, over their concerns about resettling refugees in their states, Indiana and Texas being two of the principal ones. So actually, I thought we'd start with uh, Kevin, if he would lay out exactly what those concerns are, how those issues are raised, and give us um, his, uh, you know, his 10-minute summary of, uh, of those challenges. Then we'll move to Anna and finally to Alex. Kevin? Thank you very much, Andy, and, and thank you for the invitation. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So the inspiration for the article that I wrote was the number of lawsuits that states have begun bringing, the number of objections that state governors have begun making uh, in light of what happened in November of 2015. As most of you hopefully recall, there was a terrorist attack in Paris, a subsequent attack shortly thereafter in Belgium. And in the Paris attack, one of the attackers who was killed in the raid, uh, a passport was found on him that was linked to a refugee from Syria. Now, despite the fact that later on that passport was proven to be false, the reverberations of the possibility that a refugee came into Europe and committed a terrorist act were severe. Uh, these, of course, reverberated across Europe, uh, caused a lot of countries to rethink uh, whether they wanted to allow refugees at all from the region, but they also reverberated across the Atlantic Ocean to the United States, where 31 state governors, um, the vast majority Republican, immediately raised this issue as a public policy issue. This is something that uh, the governors were, were particularly interested in selling to their people, that we should rethink whether we want to allow refugees coming in from Syria. We don't want Paris to happen here in the United States. So this, this concern, a terrorist in refugees' clothing, and these objections that states were raising got me thinking 
what type of authority do the states have? What ability do they have to object to the placement of refugees that had been lawfully admitted by the federal government? Um, and one thing Andy didn't mention, but you see in my bio, is I spent uh, many years working at the Department of Homeland Security, most recently for ICE. Um, some of my colleagues are here speaking. And I got to see a lot of immigration policy from our own perspective. And I really came to understand well, I think, the federal perspective on immigration. But what I didn't completely understand was the state perspective. And that's what really uh, led me to dig deep into this, into this research. So let's start with the recent news that just this month we admitted our 10,000th refugee from Syria. That's achieving the goal that President Obama had set forth to bring in 10,000 refugees in 2016. Now, of course, this is a far cry from what many other countries have done. This is very modest in light of what we've done in the past to admit groups of refugees fleeing civil conflict. Um, Andy mentioned the inspiration for the Refugee Act, which, what, which largely uh, coordinated with our admittance of Indo-Chinese, uh, Vietnamese, and, and individuals following the Vietnam conflict. We could look at the Mariel Port crisis in Cuba in the 1980s when we admitted about 100,000 Cuban refugees. Typically, what's happened over time is that when the United States has been somehow directly or indirectly involved in causing a conflict, we tend to feel somewhat responsible for protecting refugees from that conflict. In Syria, it's been a bit different. Uh, our commitment to 10,000 has been much, much lower than uh, in these past situations. And that's, of course, we're under no obligation to admit any number of refugees. Our obligation, as you probably know, is simply not to return them to the conflict once we have admitted them. But we do tend to admit almost 100,000 on average per year from various places around the world. Why not from Syria? Why not from Iraq, where we have significant involvement, a lot of refugees? This becomes a political question. States are concerned about these particular individuals being in their communities. So let me focus for a moment on what the federal government is doing to try to ensure that states are protected against potential terrorists and refugees' clothing. First is the federal ref the refugee program, which has a screening process that allows us for up to almost two years to go through a very extensive background check through a number of different agencies, a number of reviews, a number of interviews before the refugee is admitted into the country. Now, that is much different than the background evaluation for other immigrants non-immigrant tourists coming to the United States, in my opinion, there's a much more significant risk that there, there you would find a potential terrorist in refugee clothing, but certainly not through the refugee program, which is much more rigorous. Now, once a refugee is approved overseas by the Office of Refugee Resettlement, ORR, uh, they are, the federal government then will coordinate with agencies in the local states to try to find an appropriate place for that refugee to live. Um, this has gone on very well for almost 40 years now. And with Syrian refugees, it's been particularly um, amenable because we have about 150,000 Syrian uh, former refugees already living here in the United States, all around the world, uh, large portions in California and Texas and here in the Northeast. And so matching up incoming refugees with communities or family members it becomes a much easier process, facilitates the integration and, as you heard on the last panel, the assimilation of these individuals. But this program is completely federal. Uh, throughout time, we, since the late 19th century, the Supreme Court has been very clear that immigration is a federal issue. And throughout the next 50 years, a number of states tried to get involved, to play somehow in the immigration game, and the Supreme Court knocked them down. I go through a full case analysis in my article. But this is a little bit different. Because here, we have refugees being brought in by the federal government, background check being conducted by the federal government, and the decision on where to place them made by the federal government. And yet, the interactions are all occurring at the state level. So the interaction of the refugee in the public schools, in the public hospitals, public libraries, 
the use of some limited government benefits, the assimilation programs, all of the integration is happening in the state and local communities. And obviously, this has caused some consternation, some concern in these local communities. So the question becomes, what can the states do? What opportunities do they have to request information about these refugees before they're placed, to decide who they would like, to be selective about the refugees that are going to live in their communities? And the answer is pretty simple, none. They have very little opportunity to make those types of demands on the federal government. But they do have an opportunity to coordinate. So I'll just let you know, this is what the, um, the act says, that the federal government is required to consult with states concerning the sponsorship process and the intended distribution of refugees among the states and localities before their placement in those states and localities. The burden's obviously falling on the states, so the coordination is required. As well, the federal government will reimburse the states and localities for any costs associated with the placement of the refugees in their communities. And this has been working out very well. But now the states and communities want more. They don't want simple consultation. They want the ability to say, if you can't guarantee us that this refugee is not a security risk, we don't want them placed here. And this is where it crosses the line. So a lot of uh, strategies were attempted. I'll just mention a couple here. The first, there were some bills entered, um, introduced in the Senate and the House. The Senate bill introduced by Ted Cruz last year, immediately after the Paris attacks, would allow a state governor to refuse a refugee if, um, in their sole discretion, ORR fails to give adequate assurances that that refugee poses no security risk. So ORR, the Office of Refugee Resettlement, is being asked to affirm that this individual will never commit a terrorist act, is not a security threat to the state. Obviously, it's a pretty high burden for ORR, and they're not going to do such a thing. The House took up a similar bill, the SAFE Act. Um, oh, the Senate bill, I should mention, is still in committee, in the Judiciary Committee right now. I don't see much hope for it. The House bill, we already have some results here. This is the SAFE Act, the American Security Against Foreign Enemies Act. And this one would increase the already rigorous background checks specifically on Iraqi and Syrian refugees. And it re would require not ORR, but the heads of DHS, Department of Homeland Security, the FBI, the Director of National Intelligence, and others to certify that the refugee poses no risk. Uh, this one passed overwhelmingly in the House, largely Republican and some, some Democratic support as well, but it provisionally uh, failed in the Senate, and the President has threatened to veto it anyway. So again, this is relatively dead. But there's been another approach that states have taken that you'll probably hear my co-panelists refer to, and that is simply to sue the federal government. Uh, Texas brought their lawsuit in November of 2015, uh, demanding more information about refugees that were going to be placed in Texas communities. Now again, ORR already consults with Texas prior to the placement of any refugees there, but Texas wanted fuller background information. They wanted to know much more detail than ORR was willing to give. In this case, the district court judge uh, entertaining the case uh, dismissed the case saying that terrorists could have infiltrated the Syrian refugees and could commit acts of terrorism in Texas is largely speculative hearsay. That Texas was, uh, had unfounded fears of terrorist acts from these refugees. Not to be um, one-upped, Alabama brought their suit shortly after Texas did claiming that President Obama violated the 1980 Refugee Act by failing to consult properly with states about refugee placement. Uh, the governor refused to accept any refugees until full background checks were provided for each individual coming to their state. The district court also dismissed this case just after the Texas case was dismissed, but in Alabama's case, they filed an appeal with the 11th Circuit, and that was uh, just over a week ago. Additionally, Tennessee passed Senate Resolution 467, and this would allow their General Assembly to sue the President in an interesting twist here, 
on a, a right, violation of the Tenth Amendment, states' rights. Many of the Georgetown law students here have probably been studying this in their con law classes. Uh, in this case, it's a, a bit of a unique approach, but the Texas Attorney General, uh, sorry, the um, Tennessee Attorney General, who would have normally brought the case, said probably what your con law professor is telling you, that there's really no merit to make a challenge under the Tenth Amendment to say that's, that the federal government is abusing its power to allow refugees to come into the country and place them in states. But nonetheless, outside counsel is likely taking up this case as we speak. And yet there's one more approach that's being taken, and this is by our uh, Indiana governor and vice presidential candidate, Mike Pence, who directed his voluntary agencies, the ones responsible for actually receiving and placing refugees in the states, to withhold funding. So he's not going to allow them to get reimbursed by the federal government. He's going to stop the flow of funds until he gets some additional information from the federal government. So he's threatening the government in a sense. Um, in, what made the news in this case was that one agency had already been in the process of placing a Syrian family in Indiana. Uh, the agency was Exodus. Uh, Exodus ended up going to court against this directive and the district court in Indiana said this was a clear violation of the Equal Protection Clause, given that the directive was specifically identifying people by national origin and refusing their admittance as refugees. Yet, despite all of these legislative proposals and lawsuits and threatened lawsuits, there's really no amount of vetting that I could find that would know for sure, that would prevent for sure the possibility that a refugee might commit a terrorist act in the future. We have a very rigorous system in place already. And so I came up with a couple different arguments in the article. The first one is, of course, federalism. The federal government under the United States Constitution, Article I, clearly establishes um, the, the locus of immigration power to be within the federal government. Confirmed later on by a number of Supreme Court cases, this is really largely indisputable. Um, extensive background checks. Unlike in Europe, what we saw in Europe, the United States does not allow a refugee to come into the country until these rigorous background checks are completed. So we don't necessarily have any potential threat until after we've gone through this full screening process. Coordination with states is very uh, extensive. We are, ORR already coordinates very well with the states, giving them uh, information about the potential placements. And, of course, those screenings have already been done, so there's no reason for them to provide that additional information to the state governments. Um, this is not an area, in my conclusion, this is not an area in which the state can act. They do have the ability to consult. They do have the ability to request certain placements or to say that certain placements would be inappropriate. They lack the resources. They lack the community, for example. However, I surmise that any of these attempts, pr through proposed legislation, executive orders, or even uh, amendments to the Constitution, are ultimately going to fail. They don't have the political support, and this issue is likely to blow over uh, in the next year or so, in my opinion, as politicians move on to something in a non-election year. So with that, I will turn it over to my esteemed colleagues to provide you some uh, more insightful information. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kevin. Anna. Great, thank you so much. Uh, so I, I wanted to start by explaining to you a little bit about the IRC because most, uh, most people associate the IRC with overseas crises and humanitarian assistance delivery um, internationally and not with the U.S. Um, we're best known for our international work, uh, but we do have 29 field offices here in the United States. Uh, we have been assisting um, refugees, asylees, and, and others um, to integrate and to uh, adapt to life in the United States since the 1930s when we were founded. Um, we've assisted um, many hundreds of thousands of people to settle here in the United States, and this year, by the time we end this current fiscal year, we will have assisted around 14,000 people to resettle here in the United States, uh, plus, plus additional um, clients that we serve from the asylee community, the, the Cuban-Haitian entrant program, as well as, as other categories. Um, 
So I've been asked today to speak about resettlement um, from the vantage point of what has been happening on, uh, at the state level. Um, so I wanted to start by, by repeating the statistic that Professor Schoenholz mentioned at the start. Um, the U.S. has resettled over three million refugees to the United States through this program uh, since this work started, even before the 1980 Refugee Act. 800,000 of those individuals have been resettled here since 9-11. And for the first several decades of this program, there were a few constants that we could really rely on. Um, the first thing that we could reasonably rely on in, with this program is that it was obscure and unknown and no one really cared about it. Um, <laughs> This is a program that has been built on a very strong public-private partnership, uh, on a strong foundation of community support. Much of that support has come from a diversity of faith communities and congregations around the country. Um, and it's f for that reason, as well as for uh, the simple fact that it is a managed and, quote, legal pathway to protection here, it's also a program that has long enjoyed very strong bipartisan political support bipartisan political support in that context of obscurity, where not that many politicians really even gave much thought. So the other big factor here is that from 1975 well into the late 1990s, most refugees were settled were coming from conflicts uh, such as the Vietnam War, such as um, the conflicts behind the Iron Curtain, you know, the, the dissolution of the Soviet Union and the, and the refugees that fled from, from that situation, um, refugees from Cuba, et cetera, um, where the ideological links um, and the understanding about who these refugees were or are was very clear to your average American. Uh, what began happening in the 1990s is that the program moved away from being a program which was really focused on resettling uh, refugees um, along these ideologically aligned lines to a program that began to diversify and began to work along the lines of resettling the most vulnerable and the most at-risk refugees, regardless of their nationality, whether they were a refugee from Bhutan or Syria or the Central African Republic or Cuba. Essentially, the program embraced um, all of these refugees equally based on their need. Um, and so we went from a program that was pretty accessible and understandable to your average American to one that was less accessible. Um, and less understandable, perhaps, as we have more diverse populations arising. Um, certainly post 9-11, you have new national security concerns which arise. You also have a post 9-11 period where you have an economic recession, where resettlement agencies begin to find um, the urgent need to diversify their geographic scope. So whereas we, for many years, were really resettling refugees mainly into um, really large gateway cities of immigration, um, we began to diversify so that we began to, to look for new places to resettle refugees, um, perhaps in smaller metropolitan areas where um, arrivals of this very diverse population become more visible, um, where perhaps from our perspective, it's very desirable because maybe the cost of living is lower, housing is uh, prices, uh, housing costs are lower, etc. Um, but where you start to create new dynamics around how this program is viewed, and in the 1990s. Uh, particularly with the, with the arrival of the Iraqi population, you begin to see these anti-resettlement actors come to the fore. Um, some of you may have heard of resettle, uh, Refugee Resettlement Watch or other um, organized attempts to, um, to basically advocate against this program. Um, and you start to see in the last several years um, this real growth of this movement and their alignment with other anti-immigrant actors so that refugee resettlement essentially begins to morph into part of the anti-immigrant uh, agenda writ large. Um, so with that said, what has really been happening at the state level? Professor Fandel also already described some of the attempts here in Washington um, to legislate on this program at the federal level, um, but we had probably even more activity at the state level in the last year. So many of you are aware um, that there were 31 governors who made statements against the program. Um, seven of these states, of the 31, uh, took additional actions. Uh, for example, you had four states, uh, Georgia, Kansas, Alabama, and Louisiana, 
um, whose governors actually um, took uh, their statement uh, opposing this and actually issued an executive order, um, basically instructing their state administrative agencies to do something differently, whether it was to cease providing uh, certain types of federal benefits to refugees, either all refugees or certain nationalities, et cetera. Uh, you also had one state, Texas, that uh, put out an anti-refugee uh, regulation. I wouldn't say an anti-refugee regulation, but a regulation that um, makes it much more onerous uh, for, uh, for that consultation requirement that Professor, Professor Fandel mentioned to actually take place. Uh, you also had two states, Kansas and New Jersey, who took the more extreme step of actually choosing to withdraw their state from cooperation. So in these states where once the state refugee coordinator was uh, was essentially um, reporting to the governor and was a state employee, uh, you have governors that have said, our state will no longer directly participate in this, um, which has um, induced the federal government to have to assign a non-governmental uh, agency, such as the IRC, um, to actually take over the state coordination um, with the withdrawal of the state. Uh, so a lot of these actions have not been particularly implemented. Um, that have really stepped forward in different locations to support re refugee resettlement agencies, whether it's through donations or whether it's through trying to help us find more affordable housing models, et cetera. Uh, we've also seen amazing community responses in the face of what we do believe are still isolated incidents of hate against refugees. Uh, to cite an example, we had a Syrian family in Tucson um, who unfortunately, w within only a few weeks of arrival, had to be moved from their house because they received a very threatening note on their door um, from an unknown person in the community. And um, you know that kind of situation um, provoked uh, an outpouring of support. We had fam a family that was receiving dozens and dozens of letters um, you know, spontaneously sent by different members of the community, letting them know, based on having read a news report about this incident, that they were welcomed there and that they and that the wider community wanted them to be there. Um, the other element which uh, this this whole situation really provoked uh, is perhaps new ways of working um, in in at the at the state and local level. You know, before the threats against the resettlement program. Um, really a lot of the advocacy um, and, and certainly the lobbying that this community has done um, was quite separate from our immigrants' rights colleagues. And what this fight has really proven is that um, we really need all the allies at the table. So a lot of the, well, all of the resettlement agencies really around the country, especially in light of these uh, state um, legislative threats um, have really found the need and the utility in reaching out to allies from the immigrants' rights community, as well as from the wider civil rights and civil liberties community. And we've really um, demonstrated within a year how far we can go in creating those partnerships. It's really through those partnerships that we were able to mobilize to make sure that only one of those 52 bills or resolutions was passed. Um, just to finalize by saying, you know, what has really worked in the face of all these threats. Um, in terms of advocacy tactics, I mean, the, the first thing that, that we have had to recur to as a tactic really is just countering rampant inf uh, misinformation. Misinformation and misunderstanding about who refugees are, how they are screened, what happens to them when they arrive, what kinds of assistance do they receive, how quickly they become self-sufficient, how quickly they move off any type of government assistance, et cetera. Um, we've also really had to stretch ourselves in terms of national information gathering and national sharing of information across the network. Again, in order to mobilize this very wide array of pro-immigrant and civil rights and civil liberties partners, we've really had to double down on our intel gathering and our um, analysis of these state bills to share with, with folks so that they can really use that information as they'd like to at the state level. Um, we've done a lot of support of local actors um, to make sure that local immigrants' rights organizations who want to uh, be active on this issue have the access to information that they need about refugee resettlement, which again is still a bit of a, uh, um, a obscure topic. Um, we've also had a lot of actors, um, the one that most comes to mind for me is Human Rights First. They've done a great job at mobilizing novel voices, at mobilizing security validators, no, mobilizing veterans that are pro-refugee resettlement, et cetera. Um, a lot of this type of work of trying to mobilize 
um, notable voices uh, that can speak to um, the, the utility and the importance of this program, as well as why refugees are not a threat. Um, and finally, just a tremendous amount of media work that we've been doing, but we need to do much more as the years um, uh, come on, of lifting up that community support and demonstrating how much support there is at a community level, as well as telling refugee stories. Not refugee stories just about why they, why they fled and why they're deserving of protection, but also telling their stories as they integrate here and as they have the successes, as they become not just economically self-sufficient, but really contributors to our communities. So this is all to say that we have a tremendous amount of work ahead of us. The political and narrative uh, placing refugees at the center of this toxic debate. Um, I'm a little bit less uh, optimistic than my colleague uh, Kevin about whether this will go away in a year. I think to a certain extent, um, to the extent that there is anti-immigrant uh, grassroots activism in the states, uh, many of those states, uh, refugees will continue to be part of that agenda. Um, and so I think uh, we have quite a bit of work ahead of us. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Alex, help us understand what's going on. Uh, <laughs> yeah, thanks. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Andy. Um, it, Kevin had an interesting statement. He said, uh, we have no obligation to admit refugees. And that's right. And that's curious. Uh, the, in, the, the Refugee Convention does have a, uh, a norm against return, but, the, but no duty to admit. That goes to asylum seekers as well as certainly people who we select from overseas to come uh, to the United States. Um, and think about the cost of resettlement. Resettlement, if average of 10, 15, 20 thousand dollars a refugee for resettlement, if the United States takes in 80 thousand refugees a year, you're talking about more than a billion dollars a year spent on refugee resettlement. Uh, UNHCR's budget is $3 billion a year for the care of 15 million refugees. So it's an interesting question about why do we have resettlement? I think there are very good answers to that question, but I think we need to think those through to start. So let me start with those. First of all, resettlement obviously improves human lives and human well-being. For the about 100, 120,000 refugees a year resettled worldwide, they're in much better shape by being resettled. Most refugees, the vast majority of refugees, live in what UNHCR calls protracted refugee situations, which are situations that uh, go on for more than five years. About six, uh, at least six million or more uh, refugees are living in these long, long-term situations. So you're taking people who are basically living lives in limbo, dependent on international assistance or no assistance and giving them a, a, an attempt to re, a possibility to rebuild their lives. Moreover, as was uh, stated before, the uh, uh, UNHCR selects uh, uh, the most vulnerable refugees for resettlement, and those are then uh, taken in by uh, other countries of the world. So huge gain in, 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 uh, in the welfare of people who are resettled. Uh, secondly, um, there is an international duty uh, on all states who are part of the re refugee regime, and that's more than 150 nations who've signed the convention or its protocol to participate in international burden sharing. Right now we have a situation where what uh, Peter Sutherland, who's the uh, Secretary General Special Envoy on Migration describes as uh, responsibility by proximity. Refugees flee to a country near their home country and they tend to stay there. So in the Middle East, there are 4.5 million refugees in uh, countries of Turkey, Lebanon, and Jordan. Lebanon, a country of four million citizens, has one million refugees. So when Kevin talks about the low number of 10,000 Syrian refugees that have been taken in, you contrast that to the one million uh, in, in, in Lebanon. So there's a duty to spread that responsibility around the world. And you can do that in a couple of ways. You can do it by having a foreign country, by uh, non-contiguous countries give money, which is what the UN, what the U.S. largely does, paying about 40 percent of UNHCR's operating budget. But the other way to do that is through dramatic resettlement programs. I think if you had had dramatic resettlement out of Turkey and out of Lebanon and out of Jordan since the beginning of the of the uh, refugee flow out of Syria, you would not have seen the one million people attempting to come by boat and through smuggling and trafficking and over dangerous journeys uh, to Europe in the last year or two if there had been an orderly resettlement program, if the nations of the world had stepped up and done their 
undertaken their responsibilities uh, to participate in this global system uh, of, uh, of refugee pr protection. And thirdly, I think there's a benefit to the receiving states. We tend to think about what's the cost of bringing a refugee in, but there's a, there's a big benefit uh, to the receiving uh, uh, states. Uh, of course, skills. UNHCR used to have t-shirts saying uh, Einstein was a refugee. Okay, so there are obviously uh, lots of people who come in and, and work at all levels of, of society, but if you're talking about 80,000 refugees a year, that's not, has no impact whatsoever on the economic system of the United States. So it's certainly not a cost to the U.S., but it's not an obvious uh, benefit. I think it goes much more to our values as who we are uh, as a country. Imagine these governors saying we will not take refugees into our, into our state. This is not a serious political position. There's no way they can win these suits. They're plainly illegal under the statutes and the Constitution of the United States. It's purely political. But what an awful and ugly political statement to be making in a country built on the notion of protecting uh, refugees, to say no to refugees. I mean, we lived, uh, we, we know all the history of the St. Louis and all the way back through the, uh, through, through our history when we've done that. Uh, it's one thing to talk about building walls, it's another thing to talk about uh, torpedoing ships, it seems to me. Anyway, let me move on. Um, uh, in saying we should be taking refugees in, I, I don't, you know, the resettlement does have a cost in the global system in the following interesting but un analyzed empirically way. Um, and that is that there is some, there is a view, and this is probably right, that, that um, if there are robust resettlement programs out of countries of first asylum, will make, uh, will provide disincentives to return home. There are many people in refugee camps around the world who are, will stay for a long time upon the hope that they will be resettled. Now their chances of being resettled are like winning the lottery. You know, if it's 100,000 a year for 15 million refugees, it's very slight chance. But nonetheless, the, the benefits are seen as so huge, it may have an impact. And there's even some thinking that perhaps it, 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 in, it induces departures. People may leave countries to try to get to a place where they can then apply for a settlement uh, to the resettling country. So we, we have to be realistic about the overall cost, but, on, but on, on, on the much larger picture, it seems to me the benefits of robust uh, resettlement programs are much larger. Uh, than, than any of these kinds of costs. Andy said we should be talking about challenges. I actually want to talk about an opportunity in my remaining um, few minutes here. And, and that's to, uh, to talk about uh, private sponsorship of resettlement. Uh, the program that, that's been described here uh, is our public uh, model, which brings in anywhere from 50, 80, 100, hopefully next year, 100,000 refugees to the United States. But I think the demand and supply for refugees, if I can put it that way, is far higher. What I mean is the number of people who would love, like to be resettled in the United States, obviously higher. And I think the generosity of the American people is far above the 80,000 people we'll be taking this year. And if we could find a way to tap into that generosity by saying to private groups or private individuals, you can sponsor in refugees at no cost to the government, you would have to be responsible and pay the costs and worry about health care and other kinds of things like that. I think we would find enormous uh, appeal, enormous uh, support for these kinds of programs in this country uh, for two reasons. One, we have our neighbor to the north who've done this. Canada has had private resettlement, private sponsored resettlement since 1979. Under their program, more than 275,000 refugees have been brought to Canada with great success. Uh, through a sponsorship, a private sponsorship program. It's, I won't go into the details of the Canadian program. There's several different uh, uh, versions of it, including one that uh, lists online uh, potential refugees uh, without their names, and certain uh, NGOs can go online and pick the people they want and sponsor them, and you can do this all now uh, uh, virtually uh, to bring people in. Um, and secondly, the United States itself has had private sponsorship. Ronald Reagan initiated a small programs uh, during his presidency. About 16,000 people entered uh, under a private sponsorship program. This doesn't require new statutory authority. It can be done under existing uh, presidential uh, authority. Uh, the program shut down uh, because of costs, uh, primarily health costs. 
which may now be taken care of by expand the, the states that have expanded Medicaid and the ACA uh, may make that uh, more doable. But I think it's time to bring this back and I think seriously about um, a significant uh, private sponsorship program. Uh, RCUSA, the Refugee Council uh, of US of the United States, uh, which is the umbrella organization of the resettling uh, NGOs, of which IRC is one of the leading uh, ones, uh, has put together a model working also with Human Rights First, the Migration Policy Institute, MPI, uh, and IRAP, which is an uh, organization, Inter uh, International Refugee Assistance Program, uh, are now working on a very robust model uh, on what private sponsorship uh, might look like. Um, it would be terrific if uh, the State Department uh, would uh, take a, a close look. I think there is interest now in the State Department and in the White House uh, to think about uh, a private uh, sponsorship. Um, and the benefits, I think, would be enormous in, in two main uh, categories. First, the numbers of people we could take in. Assuming that people would still have to be screened and, and the security checks that Kevin described would still have to be done, of course, uh, but in terms of the public support, imagine if, uh, if the public were given a chance to say sponsor refugees, if congregations and, uh, and, and other groups uh, could, could bring people in. I, I, you'd have tens of thousands uh, of, of groups and people, I think, interested in bringing uh, refugees in. So the numbers would go up. And secondly, um, I think it's a terrific advocacy tool because I think that there needs to be more. We have to help the IRC and other organizations pushing back on these, these negative, uh, uh, the negative cast that's been put on the word refugee in this country, which is new in my lifetime. I've never seen a moment where, where the word refugee suddenly had a negative side to it. And if the American public, through sponsoring private sponsorship, could say, we'll take them, we'll take them, we want more, we can do this, we believe we can support and they need our support, these people, I think it's a wonderful way to push back on, on some of the ugliness um, that we, we have seen. For the program to work, though, it needs to be additional numbers coming in. I think one of the fears of the advocacy groups in thinking about private sponsorship has been, uh, suppose uh, the president says we'll take 10,000 more uh, refugees in the private sponsorship but we're taking 10 fewer on the public side. That simply shifts the cost from the public to the private side, and it doesn't increase the numbers. So if, if private sponsorship is adopted, it would have to be, um, it would be have, to, have to be additional numbers. Anyway, I think this is something to push for. I think there are models out there. I think you have a White House that might be open to this, and I would urge you all to think hard about uh, supporting uh, private sponsorship and maintaining uh, strong resettlement programs. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Uh, so we have some time for questions, so I invite those who have questions to, to come up. And while you're doing that, um, you know, it, it struck me as I was thinking about um, these issues that the resettlement program was different than our legal immigration program precisely in the local support aspect of it. That is, it's always involved spreading people out to local communities that wanted to invite them in, right? Even though it's coming through the federal government, it was the local communities. It's your local IRC chapters. It's all the faith-based and, and, and non-faith-based groups in their local chapters that you know, were inviting people in. That was a seen as a strength of the program. It was seen as a way to you know, uh, both have ensure support, political support at the local level um, and avoid the sort of, you know, sometimes concentrations of people and then adverse reactions to that. And here it's been, you know, turned on its head by these challenges. So I think trying to figure out how to do that again well and use the local level support um, would be great. Um, yes, please introduce yourself and then ask your Thanks. question. Thanks. I'm Peggy Archowski. I'm a congressional reporter for the Hispanic Outlook. Um, but uh, we... I'm very concerned about what's happening in, in, in Europe and with the refugees there, and, and it relates to here. Why, how is it that we don't seem to condemn the, the Arab countries who haven't taken in refugees, but um, we're condemning now Alabama or some others who want to limit or choose the kind of refugees they want to come in? I mean, what kind of um, a double standard are we putting here? And, and you alluded to it, and I'd really like to know what your thoughts are. Why, why 
aren't the nations of the world, even in Europe, supporting the UNHCR programs? The UN was, was founded to help uh, refugees. That's the whole idea of it. Why has it lost so much support? And how can they get it back? Well, I can take the first part of that. I, I think that while I wouldn't say that IRC has condemned the European states, we have called them out on the lack of resettlement in Europe. Um, we did a report a few months ago where we asked the member states of the European Union to take 109,000 refugees, Syrian refugees, on resettlement um, in the next year, which doesn't sound like a lot, but you have to start somewhere. Um, so I think that um, this is something that needs to happen. Uh, we, uh, the IRC recently, um, uh, began to partner with the U.S. government um, to implement uh, capacity building in 10 European countries to try to build that capacity for resettlement, um, not only in terms of how resettlement works you know, procedurally to process people and bring them to a country, but how to do that successfully and how to do that successfully in the current environment um, where there may be pockets of xenophobia, where there may be Islamic, uh, Islamophobia, Islamophobic rhetoric and, um, in national spaces, et cetera. So um, it is... So you're talking about outside Europe. Yes. Well, I mean, I think, I mean, I think that, I think we would like as many countries as possible around the world to embrace resettlement, regardless of the type of, uh, of country they are. Um, that being said, I mean, Alex can speak to this more as, as the former um, senior uh, official at, at UNHCR. But some of those countries that you mentioned have profoundly difficult challenges in even getting them to protect the refugees that arrive on their territories. So I think every country and every region is going to have its challenges, um, but certainly there are a number of resettlement agencies here in the U.S. who have also been promoting resettlement in Latin America. Um, there have been attempts in the past for several African countries to become resettlement countries as opposed to just host countries. So um, I, I do, I mean, I take your point. I think that we need to have um, many dozens of countries around the world contributing to this effort and not only a select few. So let me just a few words. I don't think it's, it's right to say that the UNHCR has or the UN, UNHCR has lost support in recent years. I mean, the the budget has tripled over the last ten years, and there's uh, so um, I, I think there's increased support. Um, uh, I think you're right, though, that the, that many of the countries of the world are not stepping up on resettlement. There has been a slow accretion in the number of countries uh, that have now begun to do resettlement, but resettlement is. It grew out of really um, uh, the West taking um, people fleeing the East. That's where it started, uh, and and it's been seen as a Western province, if you will, a Western uh, function, which shouldn't be. It should be shared worldwide. That's what a global system on refugee protection um, uh, should be, and it, and other states should step up. But there are a lot of traditionally most of the resettlement has been done by the U.S., Canada, Australia, and the Nordics, and and other states have been slow to uh, to join that group. I would say, however, that it, I think it's erroneous to say that the uh, the Muslim countries have not supported refugees. The, the two, I mean, Pakistan and Iran are two of the largest refugee hosting countries in the world. We don't talk about this much in America, but Iran has hosted a million refugees, a million Afghan refugees uh, since the invasion by the Soviet, when it was the Soviet Union. So there is substantial support in some of those countries. More should be done, though. Thank you, Anna and Alex. Yeah, Sin Caro is my name. Uh, I'm with the Konrad Adenauer Foundation, a German political foundation. I also wanted to speak about the international dimension of resettlement and ask the panel, what do you expect from the UN summit taking place next week and the Obama summit? Will we see uh, concrete steps? Thank you for your thoughts. No. <laughs> No, I think it's really, I, no, I really think it's a shame. I mean, we went through 2016 with a, a lot of conferences, pledging conferences, the World Humanitarian Summit in May in uh, Istanbul, two summits, one by the U.S. and the U.N. because they couldn't gather on one summit. So we have two, so it should have even been better. I, I see some 
commitments coming out of this. I think there will be gains in the U.S. summit in terms of uh, additional money, additional resettlement slots, but in terms of the ultimate reform of the system that's needed, like a serious global responsibility sharing uh, program uh, or new ways of working on the ground, I don't think you'll see that come out of this summit. I think what's, what's one good aspect of it is it does call, it does say in two years, UNHCR should come back with a new global framework that could be adopted by the General Assembly. So I think the real work starts after the summit when people start thinking really hard about what that should be. But clearly, the current system is, has failed and is broken in terms of solving the situation of refugees who are left in long-term uh, situations. This summit will, do not, will not do anything about that, nor will it do anything about the so-called crisis in Europe. Uh, but we do have two years then to think about what should follow. Thanks, Alex. We have our two final questioners. Uh, please start on the side. You've been waiting patiently. Thank you. Okay. Uh, my name is Thomas Pabst. I work in the Division of Policy at the Office of Refugee Resettlement, ORR for short, <coughs> at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Um, the Bureau of Population, Refugees, and Migration in the U.S. Department of State has responsibility for the geographic, in conjunction with the voluntary agencies, uh, has responsibility for the geographic placement of refugees in the United States. The Office of Refugee Resettlement has no role at all in the geographic placement of refugees inside the United States. In fact, ORR has no overseas function at all. <clears throat> now, unfortunately, people in states think we do have a role in the geographic placement of refugees, and they sue us. So I wanted to go on record here in front of 200 people. <laughs> we don't have any role. So you're all. popular. Okay. Yeah, in the wrong way, yeah. But uh, so that I just wanted to clarify that point. We're part of the of, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, and there's no overseas component to my knowledge and no immigration component. We're strictly a social service agency providing refugee resettlement benefits and services to refugees, asylees, and certain other populations. So it's not really a question. Thank you for the clarification. But <laughs> ORR plays a very important role in that aspect of our refugee resettlement program. Thanks. Thank you. Yes. Hi, I'm, my name is Heidi Rodriguez. I'm from Baltimore City. I work as both a student coach and an, as an ESL transition specialist. Prior to that, I have to preface my question by saying that prior to that, um, I worked as a projects outreach coordinator for U.S. Senator Barbara Mikulski. Um, what I see working in Baltimore City, we just had um, 23 shootings um, mm -hmm. this past weekend. Yes. Chicago had 69 shootings um, uh, during the Labor Day weekend. And while I admire deeply what you do, um, having worked with both um, African American students who are um, starting over, getting their GDs, trying to get ahead, um, as well as refugees and immigrants, what level of outreach dialogue um, is anyone doing to for, me, for us to justify the fact that, at least in Baltimore City, we are closing recreation centers while um, we're spending a lot of money? And I understand why, but I just want to understand and be able to explain to some of my populations, some of my students, why are we spending millions of dollars giving bus tokens, uh, paying for um, eight months of rent, and, and subsidizing lives when our native African-American population is in crises. Thank you. Well, if I can respond briefly to that, it's not a fixed pie necessarily that we're looking at. So the fact that some federal funding is going to support refugees being placed in Baltimore County, for instance, does not mean Baltimore that- Baltimore City. Baltimore City, sorry. That uh, other individuals are not going to get access to resources. It's, it's not one or the other. And, and also I think we're mixing up uh, federal and local resources. So if you were to say we don't want any refugees being placed, then that federal money is going to go somewhere else. It doesn't mean that the federal money will go to a different program within your community. So I, I don't think it's necessarily apples and apples that we're talking about here. But I, I can understand the, the, the concern, but they're really separate funding programs. Okay. Anyone else wants to address the question of either outreach or dialogue? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd be happy to compliment. I mean, I think th there is a reason that the city of Baltimore has been such a strong supporter of this program in particular, um, and that is because it's a city that is trying to revitalize its economy. And I think that refugees are often seen as a driver of that. I mean, we, um, we don't bring refugees to be here on assistance. We bring them to get them off assistance as quickly as possible and to 
not only make themselves sufficient, but to help them start new businesses, to be drivers of growth, and to, to hire others in many cases. Um, we do also offer a lot of our services to local low-income populations. Um, and so we try the best that we can. If we're good at something in a local area, um, whether it's tax, tax prep or whether it's um, uh, economic empowerment, we try to offer as m wide a range of our services as possible to local populations as well. Um, we have, in the last year, uh, we work in Baltimore. The IRC does, and as do, do several other of the resettlement agencies. Um, we have done a lot of outreach this year, um, especially given everything that's happened in Baltimore in the last year. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we, we do a lot of dialogue with the, the local African American population. We also do a lot of dialogue with local police authorities so that, um, the, that the arrival of newcomers, especially newcomers that are quite different, uh, they're not millennials moving from, let's say, Philly to, to Baltimore to repopulate Baltimore's uh, housing stock, um, but to, to make sure that that transition is as smooth as possible. So I, I fully agree with Kevin that it, it's, not, it's the, not an either or. I think we really have to do both. And if you're looking at strategies to revitalize a city of Baltimore to create more jobs for everyone. I don't think that our program go goes against that. I think that we're very much, um, uh, you know, blossoming into more of a community-based organization as opposed to just a refugee resettlement agency. Um, that's re really what we strive to do um, in cities across uh, in cities across the U.S. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. Um, it's nice for, for a change of pace today to end on a more positive note for a panel. <laughs> Although we've been discussing very difficult issues um, thoroughly, I, I want everybody please to give a round of applause to our panelists. <laughs>